Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me OK tonight. Yes, I've been working on getting this microphone working properly. I've been using it for some other events, and it's been working well. So I hope everyone um, can hear me OK. So just wait and give some people some time to join us. It's great to see everybody. I've been working on my hedgehog hairdo. I think it's coming out great. It's a little better every week, I think. And now I have my added ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting all ready for the big event with Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Madison. So I want to make sure I have my correct hair for that event. You know, we wouldn't want the hairdo to be off for such an important event. And um, hello, Mr. Davis, it's good to see you. And for those of you who don't know, Ms. McGann, hello in the Bronx. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, we have a very special event coming up on April 30th of this year. I will be joining Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Madison for a walk through New York City in which the two gentlemen will be reminiscing about their um, experiences writing the Constitution, collaborating on the Federalist Papers, and they will explain um, what all of that is all about and how the Bill of Rights came to be. And it is your chance to come out either live or via live stream. And what did you ever want to ask Hamilton or Madison? It's your opportunity to ask them whatever you wanted to ask them. I, Mrs. Q, will be taking the contrary anti-federalist point of view during that tour. So I will be representing the New York anti-federalists, um, um, the um, gentlemen um, for whom the Federalist Papers were written to convince to ratify the Constitution. We will be having a really great time. Um, somebody's telling me Facebook is showing a black screen. Um, is anybody else having trouble not seeing me on Facebook? I see some people here on Facebook, some people here on YouTube. I'm getting messages from Facebook. So I'm assuming it looks okay. It looks good on the streaming monitor here. Um, Facebook is fine. Thank you, Mrs. McCabe. Um, so we are in the process of planning that tour and you'll be able to join live in person or via live stream. Um, and Zoom looks good. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Um, so you'll be able to join us and ask the two gentlemen um, anything you'd like. Uh, we will be ending the tour um, at Federal Hall where hopefully there may be something going on, you know, commemorating Washington's um, inauguration, or maybe we'll have something special planned for you there. But we'll walk through the town and um, we'll be talking about events that occurred in New York that spurred the Revolutionary War and how the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were written to make sure that the people never had to endure the types of excesses of government control that we had when we were colonies. And um, of course, joining me is going to be Scott McScott as Alexander Hamilton and the great Kyle Jenks um, as James Madison, my two good friends. We will be doing a Mrs. Q live together before that to promote the tour and show you how great it's gonna be. So you'll be sure to either come out or live stream it with us. So if you're in the New York City area, that's April 30th, it's a Saturday. Day, and it is the anniversary of Washington's inauguration. And I think that tour will be starting at noon, but I'll let you know for sure when I have the starting time. There already is a mail. I already have an email waiting list for live tickets for that tour. So if you want to come and you want live in-person tickets, let me know and I'll put you on the list to make sure you have first option to get them. So um, today, I thought I would talk about a um, couple of things first. Before I forget, today is the anniversary, March 4th, of the day that George Washington was unanimously selected by the House of Representatives to serve as the first president of the United States of America. And if you don't know, that did happen here in New York, where the first federal Congress was meeting. And I say it was unanimous. It was unanimous among all of the states who sent representatives. Among the states who had not yet sent representatives was New York, because we were still arguing over our election procedures. So we missed the deadline for um, sending our representatives, but we were there by inauguration day. So just some of your usual New York history where New York is always so busy arguing amongst itself that we sometimes don't get anything done. So um, we were, um, I think the only state, there may have been one other that didn't send a delegation to select Washington. And if anyone knows which that other state was, please let me know. Um, I think there is another one. Um, so today, let's say it is March 4th, March 4th, and the year is 1793. So we are four years 
after the day Washington was um, um, selected by the um, Congress. Oh, and thank you for um, the uh, compliments on how I'm looking. I'm really working on this whole hedgehog hair thing to have it right for the April tour. It's almost there. I could see a little thing, a couple of things that will need to be fixed, but it's getting better all the time. So it's uh, March 4th, 1793. And I had the pleasure today of spending some time with my one of my oldest and best friends, dearest friends, Mrs. Erin Burr, who you may know as Theodosia Barto Prevo Burr. And uh, Mrs. Burr and I grew up together, not far from each other in the Hudson Valley and has been and have been friends since long before we were married. So she's a very old and dear friend of mine. And I had the uh, pleasure of spending some time with her this afternoon and her lovely now almost 10 year old daughter, um, Miss Theodosia Burr, quite an interesting young lady at 10 years old, unlike any other young lady here in our city of New York very well educated. She speaks wonderful French and she's already learning Latin and Greek and uh, quite an interesting young lady to see. But Mrs. Burr and I had a very good time sitting together talking about our lives and she kindly shared with me a letter she had received from Mr. Burr or Senator Burr. If you do not know, Mr. Burr is in Philadelphia representing New York as a senator from our state. And they write together, write to each other daily, Mr. Burr and Mrs. Burr. Um, and I was um, quite, shall I say, honored that she would share some of their intimate correspondence with me. So, you know, something that ladies who have been friends for many, many years, as we have, might do. And I'd like to read you just a bit of that letter. I don't want to read anything that's too personal, um, but I have a copy here. And Mr. Burr is writing about attending various social events in Philadelphia, as you know, Philadelphia is the capital city now, so there are a great deal of social events to be attended. And uh, Senator Burr is talking about, um, you know, the good sense that families have in the way they operate and the way they um, have discretion in who they interact with and who they invite into their homes. And then he becomes critical of the social life where everyone who is anyone who is invited. And he says, you know, he is becoming more and more disgusted um, with this manner and, and finds it a perverted way to have guests in your home. Um, and that is, you know, to have people who, you know, you've never seen before. So he talks a little bit about that. And he says that this is the cursed effects of what he calls fashionable education. He says, of which both sexes are the advocates. He says, and yours, the victims. He goes on to say, if I could foresee that Theo would become a mere fashionable woman with all the attendant frivolity and vacuity of mind adorned with whatever grace and allurement, I would earnestly pray God to take her forthwith hence. An amazing statement on the part of Mr. Burr saying that if his daughter was to be a socialite or a society lady, he would rather have her die than, than live such a useless life. And this of course spurred a conversation with Mrs. Burr and me about Mr. Burr and the gentlemen and the way they view ladies. And that perhaps their view of ladies is not quite fair. Now, we don't mean to be overly critical of the gentleman, especially Mr. Burr, who is one of the few men in this town who understands the value of an educated lady and is having his daughter educated by the same tutors that the young gentlemen of this town are learning from. So, you know, great thanks to Mr. Burr for being so, you know, forward looking in the life of his daughter. Um, but you may also not know that Mr. and Mrs. Burr married not for money of which neither have any. Um, Mr. Q, <laughs> you know, Mr. Q is a time traveler and he often has some devices from the future with him that he forgets to deactivate when I'm speaking to you. Oh, Mrs. Rankage, another old friend of mine from Georgia is here with us tonight. And um, so as I was saying, 
Mr. Burr and Mrs. Burr did not marry for money, um, of which neither of them have. Um, Mrs. Burr, you may know, was a widow with five children, no income of her own, and the lovely home in which she lived and held her famous salon did not belong to her, but to her mother. Um, so at the time she left that home, she left any trappings of wealth behind that she had, and she left with five children. Uh, Mr. Burr has supported all of them, as well as their daughter together, young Theodosia Burr, um, on his salary as a lawyer. As Mr. Burr comes from a very well-known and renowned family, you I'm sure you know his father is the founder of the College of New Jersey, which in your time you will call Princeton, and his grandfather was the uh, preeminent educator, um, religious theologian and philosopher Jonathan Edwards. So although Mr. Burr comes from a very renowned intellectual family, he also is not from wealth. So Mr. and Mrs. Burr did not marry for wealth or position or name. They married for love and mutual respect. Mr. Burr having a thirst to have a mate with the same intellectual capabilities as his own. And Mrs. Burr, then Mrs. Prevost, really searching and searching for a gentleman that would appreciate that in her and finding him in young Colonel Burr. I don't know if you know, but Mrs. Burr is 10 years his senior. Um, so clearly Mr. Burr was not marrying for beauty or position or a social lady. Um, Mrs. Burr is very ill at this stage in her life and is not a social lady. Um, he married purely what he called um, his soul's mate in life. Um, the woman he was meant to spend his life with. Um, so Mrs. Burr did not marry for any of those things. And although she has position, of course, being Mr. Burr's wife, a senator's wife, she's not enjoy some of the financial benefits that some ladies might enjoy, like my sister, Mrs. Van R. So this got us into the conversation of, well, if Mr. Burr doesn't think that society ladies or, or, or society is the way for a woman to find her place in our culture, well, what other options does a lady have? Very few, don't, don't they? I mean, uh, I am fortunate and I, I inherited a business from my father, a very unusual gentleman who, who coached me from a very young age in the running and management of that business. But Certainly, I would say that most ladies of my time do not want my life. <laughs> my goodness, dealing with ship captains and traders and you know, <laughs> bargaining for prices and setting contracts and negotiating time periods of travel and, and management of goods uh, from different countries into America, dealing with ports and customs and all those things are generally not the sort of things ladies would like to do. Many of the men that one deals with are not the most gentlemanly in their behavior, shall I say. And I learned at a young age from my father to have um, what we might call a very thick exterior in dealing with them and understanding that although they may be rough in their manner, it doesn't mean a disrespect for me, but still a very difficult type of life that most ladies probably would not enjoy. And I work, you know, it was only because I had someone who could stay in my shop for the afternoon that I was able to visit with Mrs. Burr. I get up very early and that is my time to socialize. If someone wants to visit me or if I want to visit and my shop is open by 10 or 10.30 in the morning. Now you might think that's late, but I assure you that no lady of substance in this town is out socially before 11 a.m. It just does not happen. So I have scant visitors in my shop before that hour as no fine lady would be seen in public until she is fully dressed and has completed her toilet for the day. Um, so my shop hours tend to run somewhat late with closing in the afternoon where I take a break to have a dinner meal and then back into my shop. In the summer months, I can be there until quite late as the ladies prefer to be out after dark when the temperature has cooled. So it is a long and difficult day for me. Also dealing with customers, something a lot of people really might not like to do. Another thing about my life that some ladies may not like is that since I do work and I do deal with all of the fine ladies in this town, I have not seen on the same level as those ladies. 
because I do work for my income. My sister, Mrs. Van R., however, is seen as on their same level. And it is really through Mrs. Van R. that I am welcome socially to many of these events, which I may not be so welcome to myself. My sister, Mrs. Van R., married the way all young ladies should, a very good match, far above her own station in life. Not to say that my family was poor as we were not, but we certainly were not of the same economic it's how we say advantages as the Van R family. My sister, because of her fine manners, her beauty, her skills at embroidery and uh, dressmaking with our mother, um, got her entree into many fine families where she married the way all young ladies should into a family, a husband who adores her and who is willing to care for her throughout life. Mrs. Van R wants for nothing in life. And um, I should say that Mr. Van R is also a prize and that he prefers hunting and sleeping outside to being in the home, which leaves my sister to run her home exactly as she wants it run with no interference from her husband. So I would say she has done quite well in that respect, but not all ladies can marry so high, can they? Not all ladies have those opportunities. So um, one, should try to do the best they can to find a good station in life in their marriage. But there are other ways that ladies can make some money if they need to support themselves. One is to work. We have many ladies in New York who work in coffee houses and they work in shops. We have ladies who make dresses, uh, mantua makers as they're called in our time. We have ladies who are milliners who make hats. We have ladies who do lovely embroidery Someone has to embroider all of those ball gowns, don't they? So we have ladies who do fine skilled embroidery and things like that and are very sought after. We have ladies who cook, who are excellent cooks. Oh, my friend, Miss Schwinn cooks for me all the time. Um, so you can cook for wealthy families who are interested in buying their meals. Um, you can, what you would call cater events if you're very good. So we have ladies who can work in all of those types of professions um, as servants, of course, which is a difficult life, but it still is a way to earn money if you are not in a position to do so. And once you get out of the city, or I should also mention there are ladies who work with their husbands as printers. My friends, Mr. and Mrs. R are printers together. Um, a very hard job for a lady, very physically demanding job um, working as a printer. Uh, Mrs. R is very good at it. And uh, so there are some of the things that ladies can do. Ladies can also work as tutors to other ladies, ladies who are somewhat decently educated, ladies who are skilled in French, or other languages, ladies who are skilled in toilet, or you might call couture, ladies who are um, good at all of those things, um, etiquette, who are able to teach other young ladies those skills, there is a demand for ladies like that. Those are things ladies can do. Um, of course, ladies can also, as I mentioned, work in the coffee houses, maybe a tavern, it would depend on the tavern, um, how you were then viewed by the rest of the town. Now, outside of New York, outside of the city, as we move into the country, most women work side by side with their husbands simply to keep their homesteads running. And those are the ladies really who are the mothers of America. The ladies who have gone out and side by side with their husbands as my parents did and Mr. Q's parents did, worked together to keep their homes running with the husbands out in Mr. Q's case, uh, a, a, a fur um, trader, and my case, my father being a merchant and the wives doing all of the things necessary to keep that home running. So for instance, I have on my linen tunic or chemise. Mr. Q is leaving us for a few minutes. He has been called outside for some purpose. Um, my, my, my chemise here, this would be up to the ladies of the house to make these for all of the family. And as you know, both the ladies and the gentlemen and the children wear these under our clothes and also might sleep in them. So it's the lady's job to make all of these. It might be the lady's job also to take care of all of the animals that one might have. Um, chicken, ducks, sheep, anything else, shear the sheep, 
making wool. Have you ever seen the work that goes into making wool? Much harder than my job. Very difficult task. So these are the ladies who really work side by side with their husbands just to keep their homes going. Cooking, providing meals. Ladies are often the only educator for their children um, while they're at home, teaching them very early the basics of reading and writing, if they have time to do that at all, teaching their daughters to embroider, embroider something called a sampler, which is a sampling of their embroidery work, showing their ability to embroider numbers and letters, um, maybe some botany, flowers, um, herbs, plants, maybe farm animals, um, the more types of things a young lady is good at embroidering, the more likely it is she might get some work doing that. So these are all things that ladies do. Now, suppose you don't have any of that. Suppose, suppose you're, you're a widow and you have no one to support you. You have no male family members. You have no one. Um, then you may end up in one of the almshouses. Um, where the people of the town support you. Um, a very difficult life indeed, where you might look for any type of work you can find just to support yourself. My question to Mrs. Burr and her question to Mr. Burr is, well, how do you think women ought to support themselves and move up through society if you are against society, ladies? It is many of their own opportunity to meet gentlemen who are good matches. And of course, he doesn't want Theodosia to be a society lady. He wants her to make a good match based on other qualities. But for most other women, that is their best opportunity at finding a suitable husband. And uh, all of the gentlemen, whether or not they want to admit it, adore spending time with the society ladies, don't they? What is Mr. Burr doing there? <laughs> If he's not socializing and enjoying the flirtations of all of the lovely ladies, <laughs> of course, that's why he's there. Now, most gentlemen completely adore this. I know that Mr. Hamilton loves the flirtation. Mrs. Hamilton understands this and, of course, understands that it's just all some fun back and forth between the men and the ladies. I think the only two men I know who do not enjoy flirting with the society ladies are Mr. Q and my brother-in-law, Mr. Van R, who would probably both rather be out duck hunting than spending their time enjoying any type of society. Do you know, four years ago, when President Washington was inaugurated, that I had to find other male escorts for all of the inaugural balls as Mr. Q would not go. <laughs> and it was quite my luck that young Mr. Madison and I became friendly and Congressman Madison also not being very sociable, but knowing he needed to attend these events and looking for an outgoing lady to escort often escorted me to these balls where once I was there, of course, I could socialize at will, but um, a lady in my position would not show up to a ball unescorted. Um, so Mr. Q left me to my own designs in that respect. So as far as ladies go, I live a good life for my time. I run my business. You may know that this is a point between Mr. Hamilton and me that I do not own my business. I am not allowed to own my business. It is owned by Mr. Q. Ladies cannot own property or businesses. Technically, I inherited it, but Mr. Q is the owner. Now, when I was speaking to Mr. Hamilton about this, and I think some of you were present for that event, and I brought this up to Mr. Hamilton, his response to me was, but Mrs. Q, you know that in New York, Mr. Q may not dispose of any of that property without your permission. And for that, I suppose I ought to be grateful that at least I have that much, <laughs> but I would prefer to own my property and my shop as it belonged to my father. Um, so that is a limitation. Um, something I think is very important in your time, voting. Ladies in my time don't even think about voting. That's not something we even bother ourselves with or something we really think about very much as we have great influence over the gentlemen and the way they vote. So um, 
well, we don't think about it. I know in time it will become very important an issue, but in my time, that's not something the ladies are so interested in. The ladies are much more interested in finding a good match, education for ladies. And that is the one way I took my hat to Senator Burr and that he is educating his daughter in a manner in which it is believed ladies cannot master the same education as a gentleman. And through this, he hopes to prove that women can be educated equally to men and to better our position in our lives and in our country. So we'll see how that works out in the future for Miss Theodosia. Now, there are gentlemen in the town who think this is quite amusing. One of them, Colonel Robert Troop friend of Mr. Burr's and Mr. Hamilton's who remarked that there was no question of Mr. Burr's intelligent daughter capable of mastering um, all of these subjects better than even some of the boys in our town. He says, but what will become of her as she knows nothing of the sewing needle? Colonel Troop, I know barely anything of the sewing needle. <laughs> And I have done quite well for myself, I think. I've done all right. Um, Mrs. Van R has not touched a sewing needle in I don't know how many years. <laughs> Her days of sewing for anyone are long gone. <laughs> she may do it now that she's older for her own personal enjoyment, but not for any other reason. But I think what Mr. Troop is trying to convey is that there will be no place in society for Miss Burr that the ladies will have nothing to discuss with her as they will not be educated and will be interested in only talking about domestic things or perhaps ladies' novels or plays or entertainment. And the gentleman who would be educated in the same way would be appalled at having her in the same room with them. So I think he's making a more practical comment. May I share with you a terrible insult he waged against Mr. Hamilton's son, Philip Hamilton, who Mr. True has called a sad rake. Oh my goodness, a rake. A rake as a young man obscured by his father's shadow, who has great wealth, but will amount to nothing. So I think Mr. True is a uh, very outspoken in his opinions of both Mr. Burr and Mr. Hamilton's parenting skills. Um, I would not say that about either of them. I think the gentleman in this town will accept Miss Burr, the younger gentleman her age, who are already accustomed to seeing her um, in their classes, along with the same tutors. I think they will accept her quite quite well. I don't think that will be a problem for her. And just like I found a gentleman who wanted to marry me, a near impossibility, Miss Burr will find a gentleman who would like to marry her. I was oh, I'm thinking back over my life. It was such a trying time for my poor mother, who would remark to me endlessly that my sister had suitors everywhere, that not a weekend went by, not a Sunday went by, that there wasn't a suitor after church calling on my sister and none for me. <laughs> this is a terrible thing to be a daughter who has no suitors and whose mother is desperate to have her married off. And then my childhood friend, Mr. Q came forward and declared his desire to have me as a wife. And everyone breathed a sigh of relief. As Mr. Q, similar to Mr. Burr, said he had no interest in marrying a shallow society lady, which I hope he didn't mean my sister when he said that. <sighs> Not a good thing. My sister would certainly have words with him about that if she knew that. But of course, my sister knows how Mr. Q is by now, many years, many years, she knows how he is. Um, but a very difficult thing for girls who do not have suitors, whose mothers need to, you know, push them off, put them out in society, get them husbands. Ladies in my time must have husbands unless for some reason you have inherited a great fortune and don't need one. But then you will have many men suiting for you, won't you? And 
I don't know if I want to give a glimpse into the future, but there will be a time in the future where a widowed gentleman of, shall we say, what's the word I want to say, of damaged reputation will marry the richest widow in this town. <laughs> and she will marry him for status. She's much, she will be much younger than him and he will marry her for money. And I wonder if any of you know who I'm predicting about. I think some of you probably do. Um, I'm speaking of Mr. Burr, who by then will have been a widow and vice president and Eliza Jumel, who will be the wealthiest lady in the future, in the future in our town. And oh, that will be an interesting marriage, won't it? Um, Mrs. Jumel, who did not have to marry and chose very badly when she did. I, I assume that happens in your time as well, as people are just people and fall in love and think they want to be together. Although in my time, of course, divorce is very rare and difficult to attain and highly looked down upon. So most of us for our daughters want to make sure that is a good match from the start and for our sons as well, as we would like the marriage to be successful and lasting, you know, not only financially successful, but emotionally successful for both. And of course, here in America, we have started the trend of marrying for love, haven't we? Another thing our British oppressors laughed at, marriage for love. Oh, who marries for love? Well, we do. It's something that we have begun here in America, the idea that you marry someone um, who is right for you in many ways, including who you love and would like to be with, as Mr. and Mrs. Burr have demonstrated their great love and respect and admiration for each other, um, rather than money for either of them. I'll tell you, Mr. Burr could have married any wealthy, eligible lady in this state, perhaps even this region, if he wanted to, like someone else did. I won't say who. <laughs> married well above his station. <laughs> Mr. Burr um, could have married equally well had he chosen to, but instead he chose to marry a woman who he felt was what you might call his soulmate. You know, a woman who he could share everything with and she would understand and her as well. So I wish them both well. Um, it's a wonderful marriage to see when they are together, the love they have for each other that I suppose Mr. Q and I demonstrated once, but you know, after so many years, after so many years, really, you just become used to one another. I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. And those of you who are younger understand what I'm talking about with, you know, that real love and excitement that you feel when you see each other. I think now I just feel excited when I see Mr. Q and he's not covered in mud. <laughs> and he's not going to track it through our home. I think that's about the level of excitement I experience these days. Or if he actually hangs up his jacket, that also I think, you know, makes me very happy as well. When there was a time where I didn't care if he was muddy or threw his jacket on the floor or well, since we're all intimate friends or left all of his clothes on the floor at one time. <laughs> now it's not quite the same. Um, so I wonder what you think of Mr. Burr and other gentlemen's seemingly double standard about these ladies. Are, are socialites, are social ladies, fashionable ladies really damaging to ladies' reputations? Are they um, wrong? Are they bad? What do you think about that? Is it wrong for a woman to use her social skills and beauty and allure to find a good husband? I wonder if any of you have any comments or any, you know, questions about that. I'm, I wonder if you'll tell me if that still goes on in your time. Um, I think maybe you would like to think in your time it doesn't go on, but I think maybe it does. <laughs> that, that the loveliest, most socially alluring ladies use their skills to attract the most uh, financially attractive gentlemen. Oh, 
Ms. Tyhurst watching from California. Thank you so much. I, I shouldn't know what California is yet, but I am a time traveler, so I do know. Uh, Mr. Jensen says, do you have servants to make your dinner? Some of our meals, uh, my good friend, Miss Diane Schwint is our cook and um, she supplies meals for us. We pay her for that service as I don't always have time to fix something. So yes, Mr. Jensen. And he also asked, is it more common for a lady to marry up or for a man to marry up? <laughs> it happens to both. Some gentlemen marry up and some ladies do. Although I think that when a gentleman marries up, the lady's family is, is much more um, oh, uh, vigilant about vetting him and his reasons for wanting to marry their daughters. I, I don't know if you know, but Mr. and Mrs. Schuyler are not, were not very approving of many of their daughters' marriages. The only daughter whose marriage they approved of is Elizabeth's with Mr. Hamilton. The other daughter's marriages were not acceptable to Mr. and Mrs. Schuyler, although they did happen. They were not acceptable to the parents. So um, the parents do try to vet the gentlemen who are marrying up very well. And I think the gentleman's family do too. Although I think it's more expected that a lady might be marrying up for security and wealth um, than a gentleman. And, you know, the the irony of the Schuylers only accepting Mr. Hamilton is that we know Mr. Hamilton certainly was marrying for wealth and position. But I don't know if you have had the pleasure of meeting him. He is very charismatic and fetching in his manner. And I'm sure he won them over quite easily. And if you come out to meet him in April, you will see what I mean when I say that about Mr. Hamilton. Very charismatic and uh, it is very hard not to like him when you meet him. Um, hello from Colorado. Oh, Ms. Kaylor tells me, yes, it still goes on in your time. <laughs> I think you have something in your time. What do you call it? Real housewives? I assure you, we have them in my time. I, many of them come into my shop and I get to hear all of their gossip about each other. Of course, all of them coming in wanting to outdo each other. And uh, they are welcome customers as they buy my most expensive silks from the Orient, my finest linens from, from Italy, muslins, the finest Italian jewelry. I have these lovely new earrings I just got, if you can see them. Um, they are some of my finest customers because every season they need new wardrobe, new jewelry, every ball, a new gown. These ladies will not be seen in the same gown at successive parties. So they are some of my best customers, but um, they are interesting, aren't they? The way they are friends, but also compete. So, and, and of course they have groups of them too. I'm sure you know how that is, um, that um, compete with each other for attention and for um, fame. Let's see. Um, Mr. Beckett says, he thought Angelica married for money and her father's encouragement. When Angelica married John Barker Church, the Schuylers were horrified to find out that he had another name that he used as he was avoiding debt, I believe. And they did not agree to that marriage. Peggy married a gentleman from New Jersey, very wealthy, but I believe he was a gambler don't want to spread rumors, but I believe he was a gambler. And um, I forgot the other sister, I'm sorry. Um, but John Barker Church doesn't, do you know John Barker Church is going to be in a duel with Aaron Burr? Eliza, <laughs> um, Angelica Schuyler Church's husband. It may have already occurred. I'm not sure of the year. A duel with Mr. Burr over rumors he spread about Mr. Burr's activities in Philadelphia, and neither of them will be heard in that duel, but that's sort of an interesting little thing. 
Um, Ms. Kaler says, I'm in 2022 and it happens all the time, even more so as society has become very lax and is not class conscious. Unimaginable to me, no class consciousness. <laughs> Indeed. She says, although my mother told me I was marrying beneath me and I see now she might have been right. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh, so I think you still have those same concerns in your time. You know, we are very class conscious in my time. More, more so than anything else, class conscious, um, where you are on the class structure. As I mentioned, since I work, I am not in the highest echelon of ladies in this town, although my sister is. And my sister provides me entree into that level of society. Society ladies would never want to have luncheon with a woman from whom they buy their fabrics, perfumes, and jewelries, please. Um, it is only because of my relationship to my sister that um, I am invited to these events. Otherwise, I, I would not be invited to such events. Just a merchant lady, my goodness, a lady who works. You know, that all of the ladies cover our skin in the sun, even in the winter with a mask, in the snow especially, to keep our skin from tanning because a working woman has tanned skin and no one wants to be mistaken for a woman who labors in life. So we all venture to be as fair skin you know, as possible throughout the year. Um, see. Um, Ms. Kaler says, Angelica had brothers that could keep the family fortune going. Um, yes, her brothers, the brothers and the other sister were not included in the play. If you don't know, there were eight Schuyler, or I should say in my time, there are eight grown Schuyler adult children, four girls and four boys. Um, yes, the duel is before the Hamilton and Burr duel and the church Burr duel, the weapons in that duel were Mr. Burr's pistols and not the Hamilton family pistols. And maybe that's why no one was hurt. Maybe those Hamilton pistols were cursed in some way, if one believes in such things. Um, so yes, and uh, that was just a duel of honor between those two gentlemen. And uh, many people do not trust Mr. Barker Church. So I'll just tell you, anyone who has two names, do you think my mother would have allowed me to marry Mr. Q if she found he had another name? by which he had traveled, not my mother, certainly not. <laughs> the door would have been closed in his face very firmly, let us say. And she was very pleased with my match with Mr. Q and she knew that Mr. Q would be able to take care of me as well as I him. And it was considered to be an even match between Mr. Q and me. Um, one night I hoped to get Mrs. Van R to join us. I think you would like very much to meet Mrs. Van R and hear her story and um, you know, hear her opinions on things as they are not the same as mine. So it might be nice to have her one night. Mrs. Van R will be joining us on that April 30th tour, of course. Someone has to, shall we say, um, keep me from straying too far from the role of a respectable lady. So Mrs. Van R will be there to make sure I don't stray too far um, from my role and that I don't get, shall we say, too direct with the gentleman in my questioning and comments. Although you are welcome to be as direct as you would like. I have somewhat of a reputation to preserve. Um, so I'm looking to see if there are any more questions going to look through here. Um, I am branching out on social media. Mrs. Q goes wherever people will hear the message of the American Revolution. Uh, Mrs. Q does not care if the platform is left leaning or right leaning or any of those things in your time. I hear you have something in your time called Democrats and Republicans. I hope they're not as pig minded and illogical as our Federalists and Anti-Federalists, but I unfortunately think they probably are. Um, Mrs. Q does not care. So Mrs. Q is on Facebook. 
some of you are watching on Facebook, is on YouTube. Um, Mrs. Q is on Instagram, and Mrs. Q has just joined something called Getter. And uh, on Instagram and Getter, it is Mrs. Q NYC, and on Facebook and YouTube, as you know, it's Patriot Tours NYC. Um, so you can find Mrs. Q in all of those places teaching about the founding of America. Ms. Kaylor says that your Democrats and Republicans are as bad as our Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Well, I think that might just be human nature, isn't it? What What is it Mr. Madison said? I, I will be asking Mr. Madison about what he meant by this when he said that if men were angels, we wouldn't need government. And if the go, <laughs> we wouldn't need government, right? If men were angels, but they're not. And so we need government. And Mr. Madison will be explaining what he meant by that in one of the Federalist Papers when he said that, that if we were angels, we wouldn't need a government. And if the government was full of angels, we wouldn't need to worry. But we know that neither of those things are true. And I doubt that human nature will change too much as time goes by. Um, so our duty as good citizens is to keep a check on the worst people that find our way into those governments. And trust me, in my time, we have our share. We have our share of ambitious men who are serving only for their own ambition and power. And it is always a challenge to limit their ambition and their power. Ms. Kaler says that the vice president is a woman. Oh, and their symbols are elephants and donkeys. <laughs> Which, which party has chosen an ass to be there? This is very strange. They're very strange, but I don't know. The future will be what it will be. I don't know. And a woman vice president, well, then I suppose Mr. Burr is correct, isn't he? And that ladies are able to climb the highest peaks as men and that all ladies, like all men, should be educated to, I'm laughing, <laughs> Mrs. Healy, I'm sorry. I can see some people on Zoom and my good friend, Mrs. Healy is making me laugh. Um, that Mr. Burr perhaps is right that all ladies like all gentlemen should be educated to the highest of their abilities and should also um, attain um, the highest of their abilities. So I'm glad to see that that will come true. Um, uh, Mr. Linden says he follows the porcupine. Well, I'm not sure what the porcupine is, but this, my friend, is a hedgehog. <laughs> and I'll tell you a secret. It looks a lot like my real hair if my real hair was not dyed. So once my real hair grows back in and the dyed part is cut off, I'll be able to blend my real hair right in with this. As it, there's some of my real hair showing along the edges, actually. All of this around the sides is my real hair. Um, uh, women are climbing the ladder. Um, Mrs. Gast says, speaking of symbols, did they have them during the beginning of our country? Symbols were somewhat looked down upon. Um, we do have the eagle, but there was a great deal of debate, as you might know, about using the eagle as our um, national symbol, as it was the uh, symbol of Rome. The Roman standard was the eagle. There was a great bit of debate about that. And Mr. Franklin believed we should use a turkey as a turkey was, he said, an honorable animal that provides food and sustenance to the people. And uh, he much preferred we use a turkey. Um, but there are not really that many symbols in my time. Although one of the things we do have that I believe you do not is all of our shops have symbols on them and that our shops, instead of being called, you know, Mrs. Q's store for ladies would be, I'm still looking for a name for Mrs. Q's shop, by the way. So Mrs. Q's shop may be called, you know, the sign of the dove in the rose. And in front of my shop would be a sign bearing the symbols of dove and a rose. And that would be how people would know it would be my shop. So if anyone wants to send me some suggestions for my shop name, I've been going through many of them. Um, so that is a little different from your time. I think that we identify with symbols for our shops. And of course we use symbols in our political debate. And um, what do I wanna say? I'm, I'm still trying to limit myself to using, 
you know, no scandalous words tonight. Our, our political debate and degradation of each other, we use symbols all the time, as many people don't read, but understand symbolic language. The symbol I'm sure you're most familiar with is our symbol from the Revolutionary War, the coiled rattlesnake with don't tread on me or the chopped up rattlesnake, join or die, or unite or die. So we do use symbols in that respect, but our parties don't have symbols. I wonder when that will develop. And I wonder why an elephant, we don't have elephants in America, do we? It's curious, an elephant and a donkey. Are they ridiculous? The Federalists and Anti-Federalists are ridiculous arguing over every little thing, every little thing, arguing just because they don't like each other. Sometimes they actually agree, but they argue because they don't like each other. And so we have this condition in my time where people oppose a policy or a suggestion that they normally would agree with, but they oppose it simply because of the person who proposed it that they see as their political rival. Very difficult, v happens very often in my time. Um, what do we have? The turkey is eaten, uh, Ms. Kalor again, the turkey is eaten at Thanksgiving every year. Very nice. And the eagle, the eagle almost went extinct, I, I assume from hunting, um, but we did save it and now it lives in abundance and only the native people are allowed to own the feathers. Oh, I suppose they were hunted for the feathers, would be my guess, the beautiful feathers. Very nice, very nice. The eagle, a beautiful bird, beautiful bird. If it was up to, you know, I wonder what symbol Mr. Q, oh, well, Mr. Q, of course, <laughs> would pick that great animal, the beaver, which is the animal that brought his family their wealth, right? The beaver pelts and the beaver first. Right down the street from me is Beaver Street named for our great beaver trade and those wonderful animals that brought our colony our early wealth. Um, so I guess Mr. Q would be an advocate of the beavers, which his future self can't tell from a rat, but we won't, won't talk about that. Mr. Q in my time knows the difference. <laughs> Let's see, you can get the rattlesnake and don't tread on me on license plates in Virginia from Mr. Facemar. Well, Virginia, we know, is a wonderful state, being the home not only of Mr. Madison, but also Mr. Henry, Mr. Washington, the Lees, um, a wonderful state, the state of Virginia, who also, you will learn on our tour, objected to many things in the Constitution, and some of those federal papers are directed at Virginia, um, as well as New York, a fine state, the state of Virginia. Um, Ms. Kaler says her dad likes beavers too. Mr. Q and I, I believe in a month or so are going to be traveling to central Virginia. As those of you who've been with me for a long time know, we always have had a dog. And last May we lost our dog, Q. And after a great deal of searching, we believe we may have found a place um, to get our next Q dog. And that place is in central part of Virginia. So we may be taking a trip when it warms up a little bit to visit and see if perhaps they have a puppy who is suitable to come into our Q home. Um, you know, he has to be mischievous enough to, you know, go back and forth under the green screen and, you know, howl and behave badly while I'm speaking. Those are all requirements of our, our Q dog, but I'll keep you up to date on that. If any of you are in central Virginia, um, I'll be talking more about our trip because I would like to stop and meet some of you. So, so let me know because I always like to go out and meet people who are Mrs. Q fans and followers on social media. So I'll, I'll let you more know more about that trip and maybe we can all um, meet in a restaurant or diner or something and say hello. Um, but you'll have to have my modern self. I won't come like this, I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Yes, Q cat. Q cat has actually been bothering us for a dog. He misses his dog very much. And so um, that is also part of our interest is to get something to amuse the cat um, and that he and the dog were very strongly bonded and he needs a friend. 
So that is part of our interest as well. Thank you for remembering about QCAT, Mr. Linden. So thank you all for joining me. Oh, wait, have you seen the New York monuments on the Manassas battlefield? Yes, I have. Um, the Manassas battlefield is wonderful. And I have many pictures of our first Q dog on the Manassas battlefield and standing in Bull Run Creek. Um, we have seen the New York monuments there. Yes, um, whenever we go to near a Civil War battlefield, we look out for the Civil War monuments. So yeah, very nice. Manassas is a wonderful place, um, like it very much. So thank you all for joining me again this week. And um, keep in mind, ladies, in your time that there are all kinds of different ladies and different ways to be successful in my time and in your time. And all of us as ladies should strive to be the best that we can be, to find our talent, whatever it is, and do our best to work at something that utilizes that talent and gives us joy and satisfaction in life. And of course, always like me, keep a, thin, a, a thick skin about you. Don't let others make you feel insecure and uh, or make you hesitant to pursue your dreams. So that will leave you with that little bit of advice from me. Thank you so much. And um, I will see all of you next week, perhaps next week. Maybe next week we'll have Hamilton and Burr with us. I will see if I can arrange it if they're both free. So thank you so much, and I'll see you next week. And those of you who are new, thank you for joining me tonight. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.